right, so tonight we are going to talk about the bronze pillars that are out front of Solomon's Temple. <clears throat> Just to give you kind of a recap of where we've been so far. We see that Solomon's Temple is literally a picture of you as a believer. We saw that there is the Holy of Holies. That is where the Lord God resides. That's where you have a brand new spirit. Then, outside of the Holy of Holies is the holy place. That is the place that we are in service to God. That is the place where God has given you a brand new heart. Okay? So understand, God's given you a brand new spirit, His spirit. He has given you a brand new heart. He didn't take your old heart and make it over. He gave you a brand new one. Now, with that in mind, that's where the doors close to the temple. Everything else will be on the outside. Let me go ahead and put this picture up. This is something that we've had the last few times. The last time that we got together, <clears throat> does it work? It does. Then you can show up there. Okay. On the outside, those outside jutted parts, that was the hidden chambers. Now notice where the entrance is. You see it? But now this is what I want you to see. There's something very interesting that we need to pay attention to about this picture of Solomon's temple. Take a good look at it, just gaze at it, because we're going to talk about the pillars tonight, right? What entrance are you talking about? The entrance right. on the side. Or that side right yeah, there. the side entrance, okay. leading to the hidden, hidden uh, chambers. Okay? Look carefully at the layout. If I was in one of those side chambers, what area do I have access to without entering the door? Notice, I can come out that side door... And I can walk all the way around to the front, right? And I have access to that front part. Now, if you'll remember, what does the porch represent? Does anybody remember? Willpower. Willpower. The mind of Christ. But now watch this. Look what happens. Out of that hidden chamber, there is access to the porch. Now, this is the thing that I need you to understand before we go any further. Every single temptation that comes into your life starts in your mind. Listen to me. The enemy cannot tempt your spirit. Why? Because you have God's spirit. The enemy can't te tempt your new heart. Why? Because you have a new heart. Understand what the picture is showing us here. There's a door there behind those, those pillars. Nothing gets inside of those doors when they're closed. God has given you a new spirit. He has given you a new heart. But it is the mind that's the part that is at battle every single time. Okay? Now, this is crucial to understand. Because when we look at our lives and we understand the temptations when they come at us, the first place they come is in our mind. Always, always, always. Okay? The thought will come into your mind either to do something or want to do something. But you have to make a decision. Am I going to believe what that thought is telling me to do? Or am I going to do what the Word of God tells me to do? So understand, there are two types of thoughts in this world. There are two types of thoughts in your life. One is a spiritual thought. That comes from God. That comes from inside. But there is also an evil thought. It's a thought of the enemy that will be provoked through what we talked about, your flesh. Okay? Now... As we see this picture, what I want you to do is turn to 1 Kings chapter 7. Yes. You want me to go back to the picture? I'm sitting over here. Okay, so if I was in one of those hidden chambers and I came outside, where can I go without going through a door? After you already come out. Yes. Notice that I can go anywhere that I want to on the outside, but I cannot go inside. So what the picture is, is the attacks come from the flesh, but after they come out of the flesh, then the only place they're going to meet is on that porch. Okay? All right, so 1 Kings chapter 7. We're going to start at verse 13, then we're going to go through verse 15. So tonight we are going to specifically talk about just those two pillars. Now there's a lot to learn about these two pillars. Okay? Yes. I want to share with everyone that the doctor has taken me off of Eliquis because he doesn't feel that there's any danger from the blood clot. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I'm sorry we were late. Sorry we were late. Thanks for your prayers. 
Oh, you're welcome. All right, 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 13. Now King Solomon sent and brought Hiram from Tyre. He was a widow's son from the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker of bronze. And he was filled with wisdom and understanding and skill for doing any work with bronze. And we'll connect later. So he came to King Solomon and performed all of his works. Verse 15, all of his work, period, single. And he fashioned, here we go, the two pillars. Let me go back just so you can see it. He fashioned the two pillars of bronze. Eight cubits was the height of one pillar. And a line of 12 cubits measured the circumference of both. So the only thing that we're talking about tonight is those pillars. Now, the first thing that I want you to see is what is a pillar? Because remember, anytime you're studying something that God is trying to show you, the most important thing you need to do Find out what the words mean, because the words are going to tell you something about what God is trying to say to you. What is a pillar? Well, a pillar is the Hebrew word amud, and it means to stand, to rise, or to set in place. So if you think about a pillar, when you set it up, bam, it's there. It's not moving unless you're saying so. Nobody got that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards we got it. That was great. That was good. I already laughed at the fact that nobody got my joke. No. Okay. That's good stuff. Now, but this is what I need you to understand. Inside the holy place in the Holy of Holies, what was it made of? Who remembers? Inside, when you go inside, the holy place and the holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, what were the walls made of? Gold. Gold. All gold. All gold. But now outside. These, these pillars are made of bronze. There's a specific reason for that. Okay? We're going to have to take a look at that. And here we go. They are made of bronze. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 27 for a second. <coughs> Exodus chapter 27. <coughs> So, the reason why the pillars are made of bronze is because bronze is a picture of judgment. Okay? Bronze is a picture of judgment. There's two scriptures we're going to look at here tonight. The first one is Exodus 27, verses 1 through 2. Now, in this passage, we are talking about the bronze altar. This is the bronze altar that was set up in the tabernacle in the wilderness. What they did was they brought the animal sacrifice up, and they sacrificed the animal on the bronze altar. They would cut its throat, they would take the blood, it would go inside to the holy place, they would sanctify the holy place. Once a year, the priest would go in and he would sprinkle on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Verse 1, Exodus 27. I want you to pay attention to the word for for bronze. And you shall make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. If you went through my tabernacle study, you know all about those numbers. And you shall make its horns on its four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. There we go. And you shall make it its pails for removing its ashes and its shovels and its basins and its forks and its fire pans. You shall make all its utensils of bronze. Now, this altar was for sacrifice. You were literally performing a judgment upon the animal on your behalf. What you did was you brought your animal to the, to the altar. You would lay your hands on the animal. You would pronounce your prayer. You would transmit your sins to that animals to that animal the animal would be sacrificed this is one of the reasons why we have, that why Christ had to die because all the way back in Genesis Christ is taking and fulfilling what happened with Adam and Eve when that when God decided that he would cover Adam and Eve's sins with skins 
Okay? So, bronze is a picture of judgment. There's one more place I want you to turn to. Two in Numbers 21. Numbers 21. And we actually looked at this passage a couple weeks ago. But again, what I want you to understand is I'm giving you biblical reference for the fact that bronze means judgment. And all of this is going to come into play when we talk about this. Numbers 21. Verse number 9. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard or on a pole. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. Jesus makes reference to this pole in John chapter 3. He says, just as Moses raised, raised up the standard of the, in the bronze pole in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be. What is he saying? Jesus is saying, I will take your judgment for you, literally. And I will be raised up on a cross and they will crucify me. That is the power of the gospel. Jesus Christ took your sin, my sin, upon himself, and he bore the punishment that we deserve. Amen. But now we don't have to anymore, just because we believe in what he has done and by the fact that he is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. All right. Now, the implication here, coming back to 1 Kings, the implication here is that judgment is happening on the porch. Now remember, I can come out of those hidden chambers. That's where the flesh is, remember? So the flesh is going to attack the mind, right? So the judgment is happening at the porch of the temple, meaning there is a judgment that must happen in your mind. Listen to me, whether you like it or not. You can try to put your life on neutral. It doesn't matter. You are going to have to make decisions every single day. We all do. We all do. For the thoughts that come out of the hidden chamber, which is associated with the flesh, remember, you must decide whether to believe those thoughts or not. If you do believe the thoughts of the flesh, you will be led down the path of the flesh, and the outcome of your decision will literally be to stunt the work of God in your life. Because you are following along with what the flesh says. And remember, the flesh has no power over you. You can say no. Amen. Okay? If you do, if you do stop the, the thought of the flesh, you will literally being the you will literally be allowing the Spirit of God and the heart of God to have its way in your life. Now, in other words, you are opening the door and you are allowing the Spirit of God that's in you and the heart of God that's in you to go out into the world. Because remember that that's the last thing. Outside of that porch, you're going down to the steps into the rest of the world. Okay? But it's not just for you. It's for others as well. Remember, what is the, what is the whole point about being a fruit bearer? The branch doesn't eat its own fruit. Nope. The fruit is produced for somebody else. How, does fruit, how is fruit produced? Fruit is produced by when the thought of the enemy comes in, you cast it aside. When the thought of God comes in, you say, have your way. Amen. That's how fruit is produced. Okay? Now, how many pillars were there? Who remembers? Two. Two. Uh, two. Okay, so there's two. If you look at your biblical numerology list that I gave you, the number two means union or witness. It can also mean separation. In this context, union and witness are the focus. However, there is a separation that occurs. Because you have to separate, is this from God, or is this thought from the enemy? Let me ask you a question. After we've been going through this for, what, six or so weeks, is anybody beginning to see traits of the enemy and starting to see, ah, I got that little trait? Mm -hmm. yeah. In your thought. See, and what's going to happen is it's going to happen more and more and more. Okay? All right. But watch this. So there's two pillars, right? But those pillars are in place. When we are in union with God about our thoughts, we are his witness to the world. Amen. Okay? That's the whole point of this. Is those thoughts are going to come whether you like it or not. 
But you have to do something with them. You either believe them and get carried down, what do they call it, the primrose path? Or you decide, ah, oh, this is not of God. I give those stuff to you, Father. I need you to take them away. All right, so now let's go back to 1 Kings. Let's look at verse 15 because I want you to see the dimensions of these things. Okay, verse 15. He fashioned the two pillars of bronze. So two pillars of bronze, 18 cubits was the height of one pillar. Okay, 18 cubits is 6 plus 2, or 6 plus 12. 6 plus 2 if you're in a bad grade. So 6, we know, is the number of man. Who remembers what 12 is? Divine, divine government. government. There it is, divine government. Now, there is significance to the fact that they're 18 inches high. As a man, you must use divine government, you must use God Almighty to judge those thoughts when they come. And it, listen to me. What, is, what, are we, what are we talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2? You have the mind of, of Christ. Christ. The problem is, we don't use it. <laughs> really? That's exactly what happens sometimes in our life. Yeah. All right, now watch. He fashioned two pillars of bronze, 18 cubits was the height of one pillar, and a line of 12 cubits measured the circumference <coughs> of both. So now you've got 12 in a circle. Okay? A circle means all around. What do you think he's telling you here? Don't pay attention just to certain thoughts. Pay attention to all of your thoughts. Now, as I'm bringing this out, when you get to the back side of our paper, you're literally going to see how God reiterates every single truth that's here for us today to understand. Mm -hmm. All right? So, another thing is this. Don't be blindsided by the things that you've learned in the past that you thought of that have become learned responses. Remember the learned responses? Mm -hmm. What God is trying to tell you is don't be blindsided by it. Because a lot of times we have a learned response that we don't like. And when we have that learned response or that thought that we just don't like, we try and we tend to not pay attention to it. Well, if I don't think about it, it's not there. It's like a two-year-old hiding. If they can't see me, I'm not here, right? Well, I can see you, dude. You're like right there in the middle of the floor going like this. But here's the idea. What God is trying to tell you is do not shy away from the thoughts that come to your mind that maybe you don't want to deal with. Because he wants you to get over them. That's Amen. the whole point. That's the point. All right. Now, let's keep reading. All right. 18 cubits was the height of one pillar. And the line of 12 cubits measured the circumference of both. Verse 16. He also made two capitals of molten bronze. So on top of the pillar, there was a capital. Interesting, this word capital, when you look at it in Hebrew. It is literally the word kothereth. And it means a top or a crown. Hmm. Ah, yet another picture of who should be, ready, ruling your thoughts. Amen. That's what it's all boiling down to. Who is ruling your thoughts? Remember what I said a couple weeks ago? Think about what you're thinking about. Who is ruling your thoughts? He is. A amen. Now, does that happen 100% of the time? No. Okay. But we need to, and we're going to learn, we're going to grow, right? But that's one of the best things that you can, you can ask yourself. Who is, who, is in, who is ruling my thoughts right now? What, what am I following? Am I fo following my desires and the things that I want to do? Or am I literally dying to myself daily like the Bible tells me to do? Okay? All right? Now, there's two names to these pillars, which is interesting. Why give pillars the names? They're inanimate <laughs> objects, right? But turn to verse 21. <coughs> first Kings chapter 7, verse 21. Now watch this. When I first saw this, I was like, okay. I mean, it's almost like God's throwing a red flag out there and ee, 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 you have to pay attention to this. <laughs> Thus he set up the pillars at the porch of the nave, all right, which is that porch, that outside part that we talked about. And he set up the right pillar and named it Jachin. He set up the left pillar and named it Boaz. Wow. Like it's a dog or something, right? So what are you thinking right now? I want to know what those names are. I'm so glad that you asked, because I did the homework for you. Jachin 
is the Hebrew word yakin, which means established. Okay? Now, and again, I need you to hold on to all of these because Christ or God is literally going to put the pieces together at the end. So it's yakin, and it means established. Boaz. Boaz is the word that means strength. So now when you're looking at these pillars, you have established strength. Hmm. With a crown on top. We're getting there. All right, flip your papers over to the other side. Let's take a look at the picture. Because these two bronze, bronze pillars are not there just for decoration. Because remember what I said, they're holding nothing up. Right. They have no structural need at all. They're there, but they're there seemingly for absolutely no reason. But we know that God, when he does things, he doesn't do things for no reason whatsoever, no. right? Right. There's a specific purpose. Now, first thing we saw... The word pillar means to stand, right? right? So how does this connect to you and I as believers in Christ? So glad you asked. Turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. <coughs> It's before first Corinthians. Just in case you were wondering. Because I was for a minute there. Oh, verse 2. Let's start with verse 2. <coughs> Anybody want to go to verse 1? Yes, John, verse 1. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Therefore, having been justified, how? By faith. That's how you get saved. You are justified by faith. You don't have to do anything. <coughs> Your justification means I am in right standing before God because Christ paid the penalty for me. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Through whom? Through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace, grace, grace. in which we would. What is grace? Grace is God's ability for our inability. God does not expect you to go out there and keep all of his laws 100% of the time because he knows that you cannot. Amen. But he also knows that Christ Jesus did fulfill everything that you needed. God has given you everything that you needed because he's given you Christ Jesus. Amen. If I have Christ Jesus, I have everything that I need. Amen. And it doesn't matter Amen. what else happens. But we must be firmly set up in grace, what is he talking about? You have to literally understand what grace is. That's what God's telling you. Because listen to me. It has been taught from pulpits from one side of the world to the other. That grace is God's, God's sprinkling of fairy dust on top of you every once in a while. No. Grace is literally God working on my behalf. You want a picture of grace? Look at the cross of Christ. Amen. He did what I could not. Amen. He did what none of us could. He took the perfect penalty, the penalty that was, that was for us, he took it upon himself. Okay. And he lived a perfect life in order to do it. Now, understand this. If we have God inside of us and he is telling us, stand in the faith that I've given you. Literally, stand in Christ that I have provided for you. Where? New spirit, new heart. Stand there. Okay, so... Just in case I'm like on the edge, maybe. What is this all about? Go to John chapter 15. Because some people will tell you, hey, God helps those who help themselves. I'm going to tell you something that's nowhere in Scripture. It is a biblical fallacy. Fallacy means wrong. John chapter 15, verse 5. Why do I say that? Because of Jesus' own words. Amen. You have to understand what he's saying here. Because some people say, hey, I was told, you know, <laughs> when I first got saved, okay, look, you have to do your very best as a Christian. When, you know, don't go to the places that you used to go to anymore. You know, try to live the best life. Make sure that you show up to church on Sunday. Make sure that you've got this and dress this certain way or else. Okay? Here we go. So we have this grace. We have Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Watch what Christ says about how you're supposed to live your life. Verse 5. I 
I am the vine. You are the branches. Listen to me. If there is no vine, where's the branch? <laughs> Dead. On the ground. He ain't got nothing to support it. I am the vine. You are the branches. I came first. Y'all came second. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Now, here's the part that you need to connect with. For apart from me, you can you do, do nothing. nothing. Listen to me. A good time of meditation is to just sit down and play that over in your mind. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's what meditation is. Meditation isn't the mm, thing. Okay, it's literally <laughs> sitting in a chair, taking the word of God and just playing it over and over, over in your mind. Over and over again. Because the Hebrew word for meditation is literally like a cow that's chewing the cud. All it's doing is just chewing it over and over and over again. Over and over and over again. And that's what meditating on the word of God really is. It's just you getting along with God saying, apart from me, you can do that. Apart from me. And just let that play out however God lets, however God plays that out in your life. All right? So picture number one, we saw the pillar. We have to stand. We have to stand in the grace that we are in. Understand what it said in Romans chapter 5, verse 2. You are actually introduced into that fit, into that grace. It's yours already. You're literally in it. Okay? The problem is most believers don't know that. Nope. All right. So the second thing that we talked about was that they were bronze. So if it's a bronze, bronze is a picture of judgment. So how does this connect to my thoughts? What do I got to do? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And what you're going to notice is all of this stuff is happening outside the holy <coughs> place. Out in front of, ready? God and everybody. Hey, right? Hey, hey. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 10. Woo. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Y'all ready? You there? We are destroyed by our speculations and every thought that is raised up again. Nobody going to correct me on that one? Thank you! Somebody! We are destroyed. We are destroying! Watch what it says. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are, here we go, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You must take every thought captive. This is the picture of the bronze. Bronze is about judgment. When the thought comes, you, it is your responsibility, not mine, because you can't be calling me up and say, hey, I've got this thought. What do you think? Listen to me. You have to choose. You have to judge. Is this thought of God? If that thought is not of God, what do you do with it? You have to get rid of it right away. But you can't outthink it. You have to have an outside source remove it from you. Enter the grace of God. Amen. The Amen. grace of God says, give it to me. I'll take it from you. Father, remember I told you to write this down before. Father, this thought is not from you. I give you this thought and I ask you to purge it from me. Every single time, 100% of the time, he does it. Now, does the enemy try to come back? Absolutely. But all he's doing is making you stronger. But here's the picture of the bronze pillar. So you're standing, all right? You're standing in the grace, but you have to choose. You have to choose. The pastor? Yes. Where do our feelings come into that? So your feelings are going to be associated with your flesh, right? So it, why are we laughing? I'm just laughing. Oh. You know. So your feelings are associated with your flesh, but I need, you to I need to tell you this, though. God has feelings, too. There are many times where you will feel sorrowful and you, don't, you won't know why. It's because you're literally feeling the heart of God. Yeah. So understand, Christ had emotions too. Yeah. He was angry, y'all. Yeah. Christ flipped tables. Yeah. It's in the Bible. Can I get a witness? Yes, you can. Sometimes, <laughs> he said, yes, you can. It, Sometimes he was, I want to flip tables. He was table. sad when he saw the lack of faith of the people at Lazarus' grave. That's exactly right. Jesus right. wept on several occasions. Yeah. God had emotions. However, he never allowed his emotions to overtake his decisions. Amen. 
If his emotions were lined up with the word of God, he followed through. Amen. Again, that's that's the whole point. Because what if if somebody does something to me that makes me angry, my emotions are automatically stirred. Once my emotions are automatically stirred, then my flesh is going to say, Ooh, I got them. So let me tell you, you know what you need to do to this person. But what, what you do, that, this thought is not from you, Father. <laughs> now, this is what you're going to learn. This emotion is not from you either. No. There you go. Yeah. So, well, thoughts of anger, malice, lust, all of those things. You literally can tell God that thought's not from you. you can tell me. Is God going to give you a lustful thought? Nope. So who is that thought coming from? Satan. So you have to see. You have to judge for yourself. Okay? Now, next thing was we talked about was our union and our witness. If I am with God, I will literally be a witness to the world. Not about how cool I am, about the God that lives inside of me. I wonder Amen. if there's a Bible verse that talks about that. There is! Philippians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Romans. Chapter 2, verse 13. I don't know why, but I need to say this. Don't you dare think that your thoughts are too hard to overcome. That's for somebody. Either in this room or on tape. I'm just saying what he tells me to say. Verse 13. Here we go. So we want to talk about our union with God, our witness in life. How do we do that? Well, we have to do it by standing on the grace of God, right? Amen. He's going to do it for us. Is there anything else that says that in Scripture? Yeah. Ready? For it is who? God. God. Dude, if you're a person who writes in the... I just said dude. If you're a person who writes in their Bible, write not you well, under there. Verse. <laughs> write not you. That's... Because it is God, not you, who is at work in you. All right? Let me read it again. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Where are you in that equation? Nowhere. Nowhere. You are the bystander that is being used by God. That's exactly what he wants to do. A vessel. You are a vessel. An earthen vessel with a beautiful treasure that's inside. Mm. Amen. 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 That's the point. Okay, this is what God is trying to tell you. He did not create you so that all of a sudden you could be this big time, big show Christian. He wants you to be an obedient servant that allows him to work through you. Listen to me. He knows we ain't going to get it right 100% of the time. There's that thing on Facebook that says, praise God that he has took into account all of my stupidity. Because he understands my weaknesses. And he still loves me, and he still wants to work Amen. with me, and he still wants to work through me. All right? So, Stan, judging thoughts, union, government. Government with a crown. Hmm. See, now he's going to shift focus. What he's trying to tell you is, psst, this whole you overcoming your thoughts thing, it's not for no good reason. I got a purpose. I got a plan. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. Because now what God is telling you here is, hey, there's something y'all getting God wants. <laughs> y'all. Verse 21. Or verse 20. No, verse 21, I'm sorry. He who overcomes. I will grant to him to sit down with me where? Oh, Did I make that up? No. It's in scripture, right? Yeah. Are you reading the same thing I'm reading? It is in red letters. As Woo! I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Mm. So what is he trying to tell you? He's trying to tell you that when you overcome your thoughts, when they come against you, when they try to take you down and you say, you know what? Nope, this thought is not from you. What are you doing at that point? You are literally showing God, I bow to you. You are literally telling God, I want you to be in charge of my life. Amen. If I want Amen. him to be in charge of my life, that means I'm his servant. If I'm his servant, then he must be my master. Yes. 
Hmm. So that means he must be, he must have me on this earth for a purpose? He does. Turn to Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. <laughs> Listen to me. You overcoming your thoughts, it's not just a test to see how good you are. He's leading you up this up. Listen to me. God is fixing to pull out the rug from under every single one of us. He's doing the good old switcheroo. Watch this. Verse 21. He, his master said to him, his what? His oh, his master. Yes. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful in a few things. Overcoming your thoughts. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. What is joy? Joy is always associated with ruling and reigning with Christ in the kingdom. Amen. For the joy set before Christ, he endured the cross, despising his shame. What is the joy that was set before Christ? That y'all, he's coming back one day. Amen. He's going to set up Amen. his kingdom. Yes, he he's going to sit on a throne and he's going to rule. And now he wants you to do it with him. Amen. Amen. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> now. Sitting her up there. <laughs> so that's how we get there. But then we talk about the pillars, the names of the pillars. Okay? This one I thought, amazing. Right? Why would God give us names of the pillars? Established strength. You're in, go back to Revelation. Go to verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 12. <laughs> so understand what we're seeing here. It's all going somewhere. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. So again, this is one of those parts where we're talking about the rewards of the overcomer. We covered this the first time around. Verse 12. He who overcomes, overcomes what? thoughts. When the attacks come. This is what it's all about, folks. It's not about you overcoming being the best super Christian in the world. It's literally about you saying, God, I want your life instead of my own. And what happens is that old life tries to creep in and say, oh, act this way. Oh, do this way. You're this. You're that. You have to dispense of those thoughts. Judge. He who overcomes, I will make him a what? Pillar. Pillar. A pillar. I will make him established in the strength, watch this, in which he stood all of his life. That's what you've been called to do. But listen to me. Those pillars are up here. It's the mind. Listen to me. The enemy knows he cannot take your salvation away from you. He knows he cannot overrule God's heart. It's impossible. But he does know that he can try to use your old fleshly part of you and deceive you. That's the only thing he got that he has left. He's a one-trick pony. He's a. <laughs> so what are we talking about? Okay. What what are we seeing? First of all, we've seen God has given you everything that you need. Okay. But now the battle takes place in the mind. We see the picture from the layout itself. But what are we leading to? What is this all talking about? This is where God turns it around. Hmm. The testing of our mind is in, it is to prepare you to rule in the kingdom. The testing of your mind is to prepare you to rule in the kingdom. What does a ruler do? Judge. Do you think maybe if you judge you should have a little bit of wisdom? <laughs> I would think Better so. have, yeah. You should have wisdom, yes. But you should also follow what the king says to do. Yeah, that's right. That means you need to be faithful and obedient to what he says. <coughs> no matter what it is. Exactly. Amen. He who is faithful Amen. in a little thing, I will put him in charge of many Amen. things. Paul said it this way. Don't you know that we will judge angels? Woo! That one just blew me away. But it's there. 
you don't believe me, go ahead and look it up. It's there. Yep. What are we talking about? Y'all? <laughs> You're being groomed. You're being groomed. You are literally being groomed to be a king and a queen in this kingdom. Yep. That's what it's all about. Because some of you say, oh, these thoughts, man, they come into my life and they're terrible. But you're being groomed. God's literally trying to tell you how to overcome so that you can rule and reign with him in his kingdom. Listen to me. Remember what we talked about in the beginning of this session? Part two. We talked about the fact that God, as that owner of that company, wants to show you what it takes to be a co-ruler with him. He has to teach you all the ins and outs. He has to show you what it takes. This is what it's all about. But we have a choice. Every single one of us has a choice. Because when the flood of thoughts come, the negative thoughts come, we can buckle underneath those thoughts. We can allow our old learned responses to take us over and take us down into the pit. And there we are in the gutter with nobody with our, in our pity part but just us. But even there, God doesn't leave you alone. Nope. He's literally like the dude in the, in the ring. Get up. Get up, Rock. Get up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Questions about this. All right. I need you to do me a favor and tell me if you understand the picture of Solomon's temple. Do you see the fact that there's the Holy of Holies where God's spirit resides inside of you? Every single one of you. Y'all raise your hand. I have... Y'all gotta be like in on this. I have. I have the spirit. The spirit of God. Of God. Keep your hand raised. I have. I have the heart. The heart of God. Of God. I have. I have the mind. The mind of Christ. Of Christ. And I will use it. And I will use it accordingly. Accordingly. Amen. 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 All right. So all of this is being. All of this is is grooming you and getting you ready to rule and reign the kingdom. Now, the next focus of our lesson is going to look at the flesh in more detail. We are going to study a group of people called the Amalekites. The history of the Amalekites, where they come from, what they do to Israel when Israel is not ready for them. It will be a picture of your flesh. What God wants to do now is he's, he's laid it out for you. He said, look, all of this testing that is coming against you, these thoughts that come into your mind, they're for a good reason. They're for a purpose. God has a purpose in everything that he does. The thoughts don't come. Listen to me. God allows the thoughts. Okay? He doesn't give you the thoughts, but he allows the thoughts to come. He knows when you're weak. He knows when you're not. But he allows those thoughts to strengthen your faith. To say, yes, God, this thought is not from you. I give you this thought. I ask you to purge it from me. But now we need to learn a little bit more about the flesh. Because listen, <coughs> the flesh is just like the enemy. It is conniving, it is evil, and it's tricky. And we fall for its stuff every single day. Okay? Alright. Yes, sir? Can I, with no. your permission, share a quick word on... No! Uh, yes, <coughs> On end times prophecy. Huh? Uh, you're going to hear a lot of people with what's going on in Ukraine say that it's foretold in the Bible and they're going to talk it. They're going to be quoting the book of Ezekiel, oh, God chapter God. 38, Gog and Magog. Okay, now I want you, I want everyone in here to know what Ezekiel prophesied. Okay, and it's in Revelation chapter 20. And uh, beginning in verse, I'll begin in verse 7. Okay. At this point, Christ has ruled and reigned on earth for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, mm. Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle. So when you hear preachers or prophets telling you that Ezekiel 38 is happening right now, it's not happening right now. Because I haven't seen Christ on the throne. I haven't Hello. seen Christ reign for a thousand years here on earth yet. Amen. 
So just remember that. Amen. Don't be deceived. Woo! All right, now let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Whew. Father, thank you for showing us that the, the things that come into our mind, the temptations that come into our lives that you allow, they are for a purpose. You are grooming us to rule and reign with you in your kingdom. And Father, may we be found faithful as we stand in the grace we have been introduced in. And the faith that we have to trust that you, God, will do what you say that you do. And we thank you, Father. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. <coughs>